my name is Christina Lee, um, and I'm here to try to make a case that you guys should incorporate some of these web paradigms that we're about to go over into your Android app. Um, so outline of exactly what I just said. Um, I can't go through the implementation. I can't go through all the details. I would love to. I would talk for hours about it. But I do want to do the top level um, ideas about what we can pull and what that looks like in practice, because we have done this uh, at my workplace. We have put it into production. And we've seen some good and we've seen some bad. And so to take that out of the theory level and put it into the practical level. So where did this all start? I hope I'm alone in this, but I don't think I am. The boss comes in, he says, we need this new, I, this new UI component. It requires a lot of state. It requires a lot of I.O. We have to hit the cache. We have to hopefully prefetch things. Uh, you know, We have to do all of these different uh, asynchronous tasks. We have to mutate a lot of data, and it doesn't work. We say, sure, we can get that done, but then we don't. We let that deadline slip because there are bugs and there are race conditions. And then the boss is not quite so happy. Uh, so we, take, we took a look at what exactly was causing us problems. And it turns out that the creator of uh, Redux actually had this really great quote, which personally resonated for me. Here's some controversy, basically saying that a lot of our issues come around come about when we mix mutating things with asynchronous calls. One or the other is great. They're great individually. But when you try to mix them together, a lot of things can go wrong. So with that in mind, we tried to figure out how we could get rid of that and how we could separate our concerns to make our timelines. Take two, we tell the boss we can do it in six hours. We build something. We separate our concerns. It doesn't compile, of course. But then once it does compile, because types are awesome, it works on the first try. And it has yet to break in production, so that's a pretty good sign for me. We got pretty excited about that. That's all great, fine and dandy to say we magically separated concerns. But I'm hoping you guys are curious about how we did that. So I'll let you know. It's based on a bunch of things from the web. We didn't do our implementation according to any one of these paradigms, but I hope a lot of people here are familiar with React Native, with React programming in general. And then, of course, there are things that work within that framework and on top of that framework to manage state. Um, pictured here, we have Flux, we have Redux, we have CycleJS, all of which we studied extensively to figure out what we wanted to do in our Android application. They all have slightly different takes. But they really come down to a similar uh, outlook on life, which is that data flow should be unidirectional and it should be circular. So you should be going in one direction and you should have kind of this circle of life that's very predictable. You know your outputs and you know that those then become inputs and you can start that cycle again, which is fine and dandy again in words. But what does that actually look like? Well, here's documentation uh, you know, from this is CycleJS. And you can see that they have a main function. It outputs something. Uh, in, in their paradigm, they call it reading and writing. Um, and you can see all of the side effects are happening at the bottom of that graph. And those side effects produce something that goes back into the main function, and this cycle begins again. Another option for this is Facebook's uh, paradigm here, which is Flux. It's more a way of thinking, according to them, than it is an official structured implementation. And you can see that they add an additional step here, which is that they have views. And tapping on a view or interacting with a view can give off an action. And that action is routed through a dispatcher. The dispatcher then tells the concerned stores, there may be more than one, uh, that this action has occurred. And then those stores change the state and the view is re-rendered, and you start this cycle all over again. So it can take different forms, but it really comes down to this circular model of data flow. And that's, that's awesome in theory, um, but what can that buy us in Android? Why is it worth bringing this idea into an Android app? I mean, we all love activities. They're great. Um, <laughs> and, and this really comes down, <laughs> I do love activities, actually. Um, but it really does come down, to me, to these two different 
benefits. One is that the logic is greatly simplified. And that's on a macro level in that my logical uh, processes at this point come down to I have state, I have an action. How does the state need to change for this particular button press or this particular I.O. event? I'm not trying to juggle five, six, seven different states. I'm just trying to do this one. And so I can do that one really well and, and then you know issue the state and then handle the next one as it comes back around. So it's simple on the macro level, but it's also simple in other ways in that your implicit data flows become explicit. You can see them. I know that my component relies on these four data streams, whether those are you know, cache hits or if they're networking, uh, or even if they're another component feeding into this, I can see that in my code. And it also you know, kind of nudges you into separating concerns a little bit more. Um, ergo decoupled. Um, they're easy to also spot edge cases, which has been really interesting working with our designers and our product people. Because it's reactive and you have to handle all cases, you get to see the missing cases because you're forced to. And that's good because I would rather see them now than in production. What is good about debugging? Well, because you have a single source of truth, because you're managing state, you get into this situation where you can do really fun things like you can compare testing, uh, you can just have a state, send it an action, and then compare the state at the end. They're just objects, they just have fields, you don't have to have any really complicated tests. You can also do really awesome things like time travel, which is states are objects, you can cache those objects, and then if your app crashes, you can scrub back in time, re-render those states, and see exactly what happened the frame before your app crashed. Probably would save a lot of time for several of the bugs that I've had and hopefully ones that you've had as well. Now, what does this look like in practice out of the theoretical realm? Well, I'll tell you. Um, there are two strategies before I dive in. One is that you can recreate this in Android yourself, and that's the route that we actually chose to do because it requires very little code. If you're already using RxJava or something similar, it's a few extra files, uh, even on the website for Redux, they say it's very easy to re-implement yourself. And the benefit of this, too, is that you get to design according to your need. Other benefits, you get to use awesome languages like Kotlin. I don't know about you, but when I have to choose between Kotlin or JavaScript, it's a pretty easy decision for me. Types are awesome. Um, you also have less ramp up time. Engineers have so much knowledge. They come in with a lot of knowledge. I'm sure all of you guys have a huge body of knowledge. And when you try to force them to become web developers, you can sometimes lose out on that. Obviously, smart people know how to learn, but learning still takes time, even if you're smart. I shouldn't have used smart. I'm learning already. Uh, <laughs> and, and there is easy integration in that we introduced a single button component um, to start. And, and we got it in the first day, and it was working, and, and that was the beginning. We didn't have to do a lot of code push integration. We didn't have to set up React Native. So there are some benefits. You know, On the flip side, though, React Native is very well documented. There's a huge community around it. If you have any cross-platform ambitions, it supports that out of the box, and also you can do code push, which is great if you have iOS friends. I don't know if you do, but if you do, you've met some along the way, you know, that's really useful to get around that two week sometime uh, gating for your next launch. The pros that we found is that almost without fail, when we get the types to check out, it works on compile. We used to have an iterative process where something wouldn't quite work. We would recompile and then you know, kind of uh, recompile a couple times, and finally it would work. Well, with Gradle and our build times, that wasn't feasible to keep up at that pace. And so this has really aided us in that when it compiles, when the types check out, because it's, it's reactive, because it's declarative, it works. It just works. Um, other things, it's easy to test. As I've mentioned before, we've had great uh, luck doing that. It's been, we haven't had too many problems, but when we do, it's easy to just issue the action, see how the state changes. Is that what we wanted it to do? Great, we're done here. Uh, it's also easy to maintain for exactly the same reason as before, and it's composable and modular, much like you've already become familiar with React. The cons of this, we haven't quite figured out 
uh, an animation strategy for complicated animations. I think that's an open question for a lot of people who work in this space. There's ramp up necessary for anybody on your team who hasn't yet adopted this paradigm. Uh, they probably won't be able to work on the components you build. And there's boilerplate code. Each one of our modules currently has four files associated with it. I know that bugs people. So in conclusion, We've found, uh, in our personal opinion, controversy again, that really mixing mutation and async uh, concerns do cause a lot of problems. And by separating these, we've had a lot better experience as developers. And so I really hope that I've kind of uh, piqued your interest and you might embrace the separation and get a little bit excited about borrowing some of these web ideas for Android. Thank you. <laughs>